My name is Eli. I'm from the Stanford Sports Analytics Club. And I'd like to th start with thanking Robert for inviting us to speak to you today. Um, as he mentioned, we are here to talk about a competition we were involved in uh, with Graphicacy called the Major League Data Challenge. So just a quick outline of what we'll be doing today. First, we'll introduce ourselves, like who we are, uh, both individually and as a group, talk about the competition, show uh, what we submitted for our competition, and talk through the design process, the uh, implementation through D3, and then finally, how we work together as a group. So starting out with who we are, uh, my name is Eli Shire, as I mentioned. I'm a sophomore at Stanford University. I'm studying mathematical and computational science. And of course, I'm a member of the Stanford Sports Analytics Club. And this year, I'm the technology officer for the club. Hey, I'm uh, Scott Powers. I'm the co-president of the uh, Stanford Sports Analytics Club. I'm also a uh, PhD student in statistics at Stanford. Cool, my name is Ryan. Uh, I am a first year PhD student in management science and engineering. And uh, being it's my first year, I just joined the club and started doing some cool stuff like what you're about to hear. So, hope you guys enjoy it. And there are actually two other people on the team who are not here today. Uh, they're both freshmen, Daniel Alvarado and Steven Spears, but they were not able to make it. So, the five of us uh, worked on this project and just quickly uh, who we are as a group. Uh, we're the Stanford Sports Analytics Club. We're in our second year as an organization on the Stanford campus. It was founded uh, at the beginning of the last school year. And the things we work on include projects like these competitions. We uh, work on projects together in sports analytics. We bring in guest speakers. We uh, consult with both varsity teams on campus. And also, we've done some work with a couple of professional teams. So we're growing, and uh, we're really excited to be here today. So uh, the competition that we were working on, like I mentioned, it was hosted by Graphicacy. It's called their Major League Data Challenge. And the, the idea was to visualize the careers of the top 10 hitters and the top 10 pitchers in baseball history. They, chose, uh, they let us know who they considered the top 10. So our task was to take the data about these players and turn it into a visual form that was informative it was condensed. It was um, their criteria, are, like I s are here on the slides. Um, we want a summary of their performance. It has to be both simple, but also a lot of information within it. And they gave this as an example of a baseline. Um, start there and see what you come up with. So I think it was Scott who first saw the competition, and he recruited the group. We got the five of us together, and in late October through the due date in early November, we worked on this competition and submitted our, um, our visualization. And we ended up placing second. So that was uh, the end result. But for now, uh, that's about all for the baseline of what we were working on. And Ryan will talk about exactly what we submitted. And he'll guide you through that. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, so I guess, do you have it up on a tab? <laughs> OK, I'll just kind of spitball uh, for a second while he pulls up the actual live visualization. Um, but basically, uh, we wanted uh, to, as Eli said, uh, incorporate a lot of different, you know, like kind of disparate pieces of information into one visualization that was really easy to understand intuitively from the get go. Um, and uh, if any of you follow baseball, you probably know that there are you know, a lot of different statistics. Even within the same statistical categories, there are a lot of different metrics that can define a player and uh, you know, give some reference as to their quality. So all right, so we'll jump in here. So uh, just at quick first glance, you'll see that we have pitchers. And um, you scroll down, so there's, those are your top 10 pitchers. And then you have your top 10 hitters. And you'll see we kind of have like two major areas of, of the visualization. One is this kind of like timeline chart, and the other is this uh, kind of like hexagon to the side. And so we'll start in with uh, pitchers and what their timeline chart kind of uh, tells you. Um, so we decided that the best way to um, uh, inform a, 
someone who's looking at this about the quality of a picture over time, uh, kind of breaks down into two uh, st statistics. One is, um, so the red line is what we call, uh, so wins above replacement as calculated through uh, the, r the number of runs that they allow per nine innings. Uh, and the dotted blue line is the same, so wins above replacement again, but uh, calculated through a statistic called fielding independent pitching. And uh, we'll scroll through a few examples of just looking at this chart on the left. And you'll see that, in general, the dotted blue line is uh, a bit smoother than the red line. And uh, if you guys know about the two different statistics that we're charting here, um, fielding independent pitching uh, kind of takes out a little bit of the luck factor uh, of um, you know, how much does a pitcher get scored on. And so as a result, it's a little bit better of an indicator of skill over time. And so that's why it's more stable over time as well, in general. Um, OK, so now getting back to yeah, so the chart itself, you'll see that it, this is kind of like probably really small for you guys to see. But uh, when it's on the screen, it's actually pretty nice. So you'll see like across, kind of under the chart, there's, uh, there's some text. And so vertically, you know, for each season, we have uh, whether or not they, or if they were the league leader in a particular statistical category for that season, uh, we've noted that on there. So examples are, you know, wins, earn run average, shutouts, uh, all that kind of thing. Um, we also have um, an icon si similarly, like vertically aligned with, you know, the season uh, for whether or not the team won the World Series. So that's kind of this like trophy icon that sits above the graph. Uh, and then along the bottom, we track um, kind of individual uh, end of season awards. So this is All Star, Cy Young, and MVP. Obviously, it's kind of unfair to expect Cy Young to win a Cy Young award, but um, uh, yeah. So that's that's there. So like for for later pitchers, you'll you know you'll start to see uh, these awards pop up along the bottom. And uh, I guess another thing to to mention is that. Uh, Along, along, across the top, you'll see kind of the start and end dates of their careers. And you'll see that we've kind of like shifted them around kind of left to right relative to each other. And that's because we wanted to uh, compare players across the seasons for which they were at the same age. So if you just go vertically, you know, down all of, you know, down all of the charts that will be comparing their, for example, age 25 season or age 26 season. Uh, okay, cool. So now let's move to the right side. Uh, this uh, hexagon, uh, call it radar chart. Um, so I guess the first thing to mention is our kind of inspiration for including this as well comes from, at least the, the reason I came up with it was uh, in, inspired by uh, sports video games. In a lot of like, if you play like NBA 2K16 or whatever, right, you'll see if you, if you pull up a player's information, you'll see that their um, attributes, like it would be like, oh, this guy is a 93 at three-point shooting, say like Steph Curry, right? He's probably like a 99 at three-point shooting, but whatever. Um, right? But then you would see that kind of you know, projected out on an axis of this uh, polygon. And then the intuition right, is that the larger the area of the polygon, then the better the player is at all the different stats that are represented there. So as you can see, um, we have here uh, wins, ERA, batting average against, strikeouts, innings pitched, and uh, fielding percentage. And um, so these are what we considered basic stats. Uh, and then so we had, you know, being sports analytics club, we thought, you know, it would be nice to have, you know, more advanced saver metrics that we think might more accurately capture, um, you know, the true quality of a pitcher. So if you toggle over advanced stats, so now we've got some uh, different stats going on. So home runs allowed per nine innings, fielding independent pitching, uh, batting average, balls in play, strikes. Uh, Strikes per walk, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So you can see that this uh, this polygon changes shape. Obviously, uh, well, not least of reasons, right? They're just different stats. Um, so then, um, we also uh, encoded the ability to kind of view over, you know, time times of interest. So as you can see, I just moved this starting year bit. I don't know if that's like really hard to read, but I just moved it up by a few seasons, and then so. On the left, it'll show the corresponding range for which you know, that applies, the polygon updates. Um, and just kind of like as a matter of like, I don't know, is fun and like interesting to do, we also like took the uh, logos of the teams they were on and like, you know, updated for like, oh, what team were they on for the majority of the time that you've selected? 
Um, I believe that's it for pitchers. Uh, so let's move on to hitters. Um, the concepts are very similar, right? So again, the displaced, the displacement left and right is to align age o over time, as opposed to you know the first year or second year of their career. Um, so, but now we've uh, broken down the wins above replacement for each player. Uh, Obviously, they're not pitchers, so they don't really get you know, pitching-based stats. So, so we have three categories of their wins above replacement. Uh, the top in orange is uh, based on their base running. The blue, which is the majority of it for most of the players, is based on their hitting. And the green is based on their fielding. Uh, and then again, uh, the text that kind of is like in the body of the chart uh, shows uh, statistical categories for which they led the league in for those seasons. Um, and instead of, oh, sorry, instead of um, tracking uh, a Cy Young Award, then we track the Gold Glove. Uh, but yeah, so then the, the stats on the, on the right side uh, in, in these uh, radar charts, so we have, again, like our basic uh, stats that might show up in a TV broadcast, right? Um, and then we can toggle over to advanced stats that gives um, you know, more sabermetric view, understanding of, of their careers. Um, cool. And I think the last part that I'm going to mention is that we also built an ability to compare two players side by side. So, right, if you're looking at this, you, you might be scrolling down, you're like, oh, but I want to look at, you know, <laughs> two players who aren't necessarily very close to each other visually on the screen. So, um, whoa. Um, so right, let's say that we wanted to compare two, two hitters from the top and the bottom of the chart. Uh, and so there we go. So then it just pops up and it shows it to you side by side. Um, is there anything I'm missing? Yeah, all right, cool. Uh, so then I'm going to hand it off back to Eli. All right, so that's the, the summary of what we submitted to the competition. And now I'm going, I, uh, yeah, I'm going to discuss how we implemented these different designs. So I did all of the D3 work for this competition. It was actually my first time using D3 ever. So it was a very big stepping uh, from nothing, from actually learning D3 explicitly for this competition to getting to the point of putting together this website that we submitted. So an overview of the tools we use, obviously D3. Um, and on top of that, just for anyone who's interested, it was also Bootstrap and jQuery. So going through uh, the, the components of our visualization one by one, rather than talking about exactly like how I made it, I'm sure you guys have plenty of experience in that, I'll, I'll talk about how my experience was using D3 and kind of the takeaways that I came off from, um, from this experience. So this is an example of one of the pitchers, Roger Clemens. And as Ryan mentioned, um, it's clearly a time plot. And I found I was very pleasantly surprised getting from my lack of knowledge at all about D3 to getting to um, this product. And there were a lot of features in D3 that I thought were very, um, that I, w I really enjoyed using because of their ease of implementation. So I use the Axis features, obviously. Um, and one thing that in particular that was interesting was the ability to standardize the ages um, using a common Axis um, access function. And uh, like I said, I'm sure these things aren't too revolutionary to, to all of you, but it was exciting for me to be able to put together, um, put together this graph from starting out from nothing and getting up to, to what we had. So the pictures was actually the easier of the two graphs to make because it's simply a time plot throughout all the years. Um, there was a little bit more of a challenge to getting the hitters to work. So the added component with hitters is that clearly it's stacked. and. We had to figure out a way to vis both visualize the stacking and also to deal with the cases such as this where we have a negative. And that was um, something that we worked out and 
you'll see in a bit that it got better as time progressed. But uh, the ability to use the D3 um, utilities, the uh, fill, and all of that, it was, uh, I, I was pleasantly surprised on how it came together and how um, I was able to implement the, the graph uh, and the, both for pitchers and hitters, um, and how it, how it was able to go from, like I said, just learning D3 to putting together this product. So finally, um, the part that D3 came in handy the most for was these polygons that Ryan was talking about. The two aspects of D3 that I was most, um, that I enjoyed most were the transitions and just the animations and interactivity that we could use. Um, so as Ryan demoed, we have the ability to switch with the toggles. We, was hoping, we were hoping to get more interactive with clicks and all that, but we ended up just uh, using the HTML elements. And the, the ease with which we were able to implement these transitions, I was very impressed personally. Again, you, I'm sure, know all about that. But it was, um, it was fun to have it come together and so quickly turn from just having the raw data to turning it into this, um, this product. One thing to note here in terms of design for these polygons is it was kind of a challenge to think about how do we design it such that we visualize both the top end and say, like, what, what does a bad player look like? So what we ended up doing was we had the outside rim be red. That, was, that reflects the league leader over the average league leader over the series of years. So in this case, say for Walter Johnson, 1910 to 1919, he was leading the league every, basically every year in strikeouts. So he's all the way out there. Whereas this inner uh, blue hexagon that's in the middle, that represents the average of the league averages of, over those years. So in terms of the design aspect of it, that presented some challenges because just from lack of data, we had to, uh, we just interpolated between the basically 100% and 50% and anything below 50% interpolated beneath that. But unfortunately, with the lack of data, it would have been helpful to have something say like percentiles, but that wasn't available, at least with the amount of data that we had. So I think that's all there is to say for now about the D3 implementation. Um, at the end, you'll have opportunity to ask questions if there's anything in particular that people are curious about. But that's the overview of D3. And now we're going to talk, uh, Scott will talk to uh, everybody about uh, our process of working together as a team. So this was a group project. And when you hear that, maybe you're thinking back to that time in undergrad where you had you know, a group of three or four students get together. And seeing as how everyone in here is you know, a developer interested in D3, I'm guessing that you guys were the one who were up all night working on the project while your teammates were playing video games or something. I don't know. Um, but this was actually a group project uh, that came together well as a team effort, um, at least I think. And hopefully, oh yeah, they're nodding. Eli and Ryan agree with me on that. Um, and in retrospect, this project broke down into four pieces. And we were, we were able to identify those pieces from the beginning. It started with the data collection. We weren't given the data that we were plotting. We had to pull it off of sites like fan graphs and baseball reference manually. Um, so one of, one of our group members was responsible for coordinating that. And all of us helped in with just the pitched in with the manual labor. Um, now, on top of that, we were developing in both R and D3. Uh, the reason for these two is because, A, these were the two that were recommended by Graphicacy. And I was very familiar as a statistician with R. But we knew that D3 would have some capabilities in terms of making the graphs interactive that we wanted to implement in order to have a better submission. Um, so, you know, the data feeds into both the work in R and D3, and then the work in R fed into the work in D3. Because we had more experience with R, 
we were able to prototype some of the ideas in R that we wouldn't have thought of if we were just working in D3. But by working in R and plotting some of the things we already knew how to do, we could then ask ourselves, how do we do that in D3? So to see an example, these are our initial prototypes on November 1st. That's five days before the submission deadline. D3 on top and R on the bottom. Okay. Uh, so you know, immediately we were able to come up with a more finished product in R. And it took us a little bit longer because like we said, this was our first time working in D3 to get a similar product in D3. It took some time to figure out you know, things as simple as changing the fonts and uh, you know, using smoother lines rather than the rigid ones, for example, in the first prototype. And the, the skill hexagons uh, were almost a completely separate project um, where you know, Ryan was the one that was really developing this and coming up with the logos and blasting out the background in Photoshop. Uh, there was a lot of work to be done there that was basically, at that point, just fed into the D3 aspect of the project. So to give you a sense of the timeline, the competition started October 12th, and it was four and a half weeks until the deadline. Okay? And it wasn't until the end of that first week that we got our team together, our team of five, and we had our first brainstorming meeting where everybody came with what they'd, uh, what they'd imagined, you know, written it with a colored pencil uh, or, uh, or Sharpies um, on paper, just you know, showing the ideas that they had for the visualization. So at that point, we only had three, me three and a half weeks left before submission. And so that was time for you know, three meetings. Uh, the, the first of which was, was brainstorming, like I said. The second of which we you know, worked out some of the details and made a plan for gathering the data. Um, and the third meeting uh, is where, the, the third meeting uh, was when we were really you know, getting ready to start putting, implementing this in D3 um, and, uh, and working out the specifics of how we were going to do that. Okay. Um, but that meant that uh, we had our first prototype in D3 on October 31st, uh, which was just a week before the deadline. Uh, and so just to show you that process, fill you in between that first prototype and our final submission, uh, this was our first accomplishment, right? Starting from nothing in D3, just putting some data on the board. This is Walter Johnson. This is his uh, war over the course of his career uh, in the two different versions of war, like Ryan was talking about. And then a couple days later, we had this. Okay? We had the, uh, the league leader statistics in yellow. And you know, it's, it's starting, we've got labels on our axes, which is always a good thing. Okay? The next day, we've got the, we've got the hexagon. It's a hexagon. There's, nothing, there's no data there, but we've got the hexagon. We've got the placeholders for the awards. Uh, the next day, this is still Walter Johnson. We finally got some data in the hexagon. And it was at this point, you know, four days before the deadline that Ryan sent out this picture. And I was blown away by it. This is really cool. You know, we've, this, this hexagon looks way better than, um, you know, what we're currently working with, with the logo in the background and the team specific coloring of the, of the I guess it was the Pentagon at this point. Um, so, so at this point, you know, we're trying to get uh, this, this really visually attractive version of the skills polygon in our data visualization. Uh, and we had that, you know, the same day. So now we're looking at Albert Pujols, a hitter. And uh, at this point, we're, we're not stacking the different wars for hitters. And, you know, we've, we've got this, you know, ugly white background in the logo. But, uh, you know, the next day, you know, we're starting to look a little bit closer to a finished product. Um, we've got the stacked wars for fielding, batting, and, and, uh, and base running. Uh, you know, the, the skills polygon is starting to look a little bit closer, still not interactive yet. Uh, and there's still a few things we'd like to clean up, uh, like the colors, the color choice here isn't ideal. Um, but it was at this point with about three days left that we had this really long email thread between all five of us where Steven was pulling in new data um, that we could plug into our visualization. And uh, Ryan was coming in with the new logos uh, that he you know, worked in Photoshop to, uh, to really work on you know, blasting out the background and making it a more attractive presentation. Uh, you know, I'm providing feedback on you know, the color scheme and other minor things like that, details about 
what the bottom of this graph should look like. And of course, Eli is doing all the work in D3, actually <laughs> implementing what we're telling him to do. Um, and so here we are uh, one day before the deadline. You know, there's still an issue with, uh, with the details of you know, what's going on with the fielding value at the bottom of the graph um, before we reached our final submission uh, one day in advance. Uh, so, you know, thanks again, Robert, for, you know, inviting us here. Uh, we did our best to fill the time, but at this point, we need your help, all right? We need your help to fill the 45 minutes that we've been given. So, um, at this point, I'll, I'll open the floor to questions. Oh, hey. Look at that. Yeah, I wanted this one. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so this is, at the very top, this is cumulative. So they're stacked. So the number at the top is cumulative. So now, the orange one is like offense, defense, and BSR? So the, the top of the orange is fielding, hitting, and base running, the, okay. the top of the orange. The area which is orange, the area which is orange is the base running value. Um, but, you know, the ordering actually was a very deliberate choice. We chose to have uh, fielding at the bottom because there's a lot of players for whom the fielding value is negative. And so we need that to be at the bottom in order for the graph to be interpretable. That way you can have, you know, this green dips down and the blue starts here. Okay. So, so that, was, that was a very deliberate choice. And then putting the base running at the top was also a deliberate choice because it would be so thin. We felt that putting it at the top would be the most sensible thing to do, um, especially because for many players, the combination of fielding and base running may be negative. So we wanted, we wanted batting to be right on top of fielding to be sure that after we included those two, we'd have positive value. Great question. Thank you. Excellent question. <laughs> yeah, good point. Thanks, Robert. So, so the question was, what, what were some of the contentious issues that we had to discuss as a team? Um, you know, what were the, some of the things that we disagreed on? And could, could one of you flip to a full visualization, which includes the hexagon? There you go. OK. Um, so one of the big things was figuring out exactly which statistics we would choose in this hexagon, um, both for the basic stats and for the advanced stats. Um, and uh, one of the issues with these stats is for some of them, lower is actually better. And so, uh, we, you know, that, that presents just a minor issue. You know, you need to you need to flip, uh, flip the direction for those statistics. Um, but more importantly than that, you know, there there are a ton of statistics that we could have considered, and a ton of them were suggested, and we really wanted to limit it to six. So it was. Uh, Choosing which statistics exactly um, we would we would be using, which which I think was one of the which was I, I think was one of the things we argued about more often. Has, has any of you come up? Yeah, there's one other thing. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's minor. Uh, one other thing that I can think of is that when we are, actually I could probably show you it. Um, so as we were going through, you'll see here I had um, years along the bottom. 
and they were like, regularly spaced out. And at this point, we actually hadn't included any component of age. And as time went on, uh, so far there's still those, that year axis, the horizontal axis at the bottom is still there. But at some point right around here, we transitioned to the axis on the top. And I remember Scott was advocating for it. Ryan was advocating against that change. Yeah. But uh, that is what we ended up going with. And the main reason that we did is that we liked how we could get the age component in there uh, to enable a better comparison. But it, I mean, I didn't think it mattered too much, honestly. <laughs> but that was one thing that we had some disagreement about. So Scott and I have known each other since last year. Uh, like I said, I'm a sophomore. Scott's what, your two and a half years at Stanford, and Brian just got to Stanford this this year. So uh, we haven't known each other all too long. Uh, but we, like, I met Brian for the most part through this project. And anything else to say? Um, yeah. So we we met each other and we. So the way that we formed this team is, you know, we've got a, a sports analytics club at Stanford, at Stanford, which has, I think, 60 students on the list. Um, who, you know, some of them have expressed interest in baseball, and some of them exp have expressed interest in other sports. So 20 of them were interested in baseball. We just sent out the uh, the email to those 20 to see who'd be interested in joining us. And the five who responded, you know, are the five who are on the team. And we just started working like that. So how does the analytics club work with the uh, Cardinals teams? Do you uh, have any resources for, for fans of the Sanford baseball team? Uh, sure. So we're in our second year now consulting for the varsity basketball team. Um, and in a moment, I'll hand off to Eli to talk more about that. Uh, we've also uh, tried to expand that to the women's basketball team. And we've also started talking with the Stanford Club baseball team. And again, Eli has got the, what, what did I say? Oh, I play on the club baseball team, yeah. No, the varsity baseball team is the one that we were consulting for, uh, or that we're, we're trying to start a relationship with. You know, it's tough because uh, we really need buy-in from the coaches in order to do that. You know, the coaches need to see the value themselves in the analytics. Otherwise, there's no value in, in what we're doing. But Eli's got an example, has an idea for a pitch tracker that could be really beneficial to the varsity baseball team. Um, and can you talk about what you've done uh, in the past for the varsity basketball team? So for the basketball team, uh, we started a relationship with them last year. And it started out with basically us going to them and saying what would be most helpful that we can provide. Because we were new on campus and we wanted to do what we could. And what the main outcome was is we provided scouting reports for almost every game uh, starting in conference play last year for the varsity basketball team, men's basketball team. and. Uh, we also worked on a practice tracker app that is still in um, development, I guess you would say, that they uh, started to use this year and will ho hopefully continue to use going forward. And that's to help them better track their practices and uh, evaluate their players who aren't getting game time. But the main thing we, that we did was work for, work for them on the uh, scouting reports. And like Scott mentioned, we're hoping to go forward with the relationship with the baseball team, as you mentioned, and help them with analyzing their pitchers, analyzing their hitters based on a pitch-by-pitch -pitch, um, form of entering the, their data during practice, during games, and then giving them a, a way to visualize that data and see what, um, see what their pitchers are throwing, where they're throwing, uh, what type of pitches, all of that. And, get them from putting it on paper and essentially throwing it into a closet and uh, to go from that to actually having access to it and being able to you know, use it to their advantage. Um, this isn't quite your question, but related to it, we've also worked, we did a project with the San Jose Sharks last quarter, or last year, I should say, 
And I feel like I'm forgetting one thing that one other thing that we did. Um, oh, there was a project with the San Francisco 49ers. So we've been interfacing a little bit with some professional teams, and that's been a really good experience too. So looking at the data, do you have any like uh, a lot of players are span multiple generations. So do you have any sense of summary of being able to compare a player from one era to another era, looking at the data that way, and using the visualizations? Yeah, so the question was, um, was about comparing players who played during different eras and allowing the data that comes through different contexts to be compared in a, like a standard context? Yeah. Okay. So do you want to, I feel like you might have more to say about this, but um, one thing that's great about war, uh, wins above replacement, is that it's a statistic that has been developed such that it can be applied backwards. Um, and that allows us, say, on, I think Ryan pulled up, I forget which, um, which hitter it was way back, but it was somebody in early 1900s and compared it to Albert Pujols, who's playing right now. And through that, you can see that there's the ability, yeah, Honus Wagner. Um, there's the ability to compare people on the same scale and kind of transcend that context um, to have a more direct comparison. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the question was, is there something that I wanted to do that we wanted to implement that we didn't get to or that we weren't able to do uh, in using D3? And I'd say the biggest thing, uh, if we close this down, is, well, there are a few things. The first is I wanted to be able to like, highlight or like, click and drag on years and uh, get more information about those years. I wanted to be able, we had a lot more data than we ended up showing on this visualization, um, there were all sorts of data that we didn't use. And essentially, we, for this plot, we just used uh, the war statistics and a binary. Were they a league leader in certain categories or not in each year? Um, I wanted to be able to like, select any given statistic of the 20 or 30 that we had, allow it to be mapped both in terms of like, how they did on, say, a um, percentile basis or uh, similar to here on a comparing to league best, league average, that kind of thing, and do that on a more interactive basis rather than only through these um, HTML elements. So that was, that was the main thing. Um, yeah, and anything else that I could have come up with, with um, clicking and dragging and like more user interaction is what I was hoping to do, but then just through lack of time, didn't get to it. You mentioned that we're probably all familiar with certain things that you're bringing up, but yeah. not, not everyone here is an expert in D3. I'm super in D3. Uh, were, were there any like sticking points that you got through in an interesting way that now you're, you're never going to forget, or certain sticking points that you got yeah, I'd say one thing, yeah, the question was, uh, were there certain problems that either my experience led me to like, really understand that, or how to get around that problem better, or certain things that I wasn't able to get around through D3? Is that, yeah, so one thing is that I now, I've used D3 a couple of times since then, since this project, and I now know like, much better how to use the, like the data function and the using all of the D3 tools that allow you to more um, concisely and through D3 um, make everything kind of come together through like the chain functions. I was doing not as much chaining as I should have been or could have been, and so I was doing um, like my own for loops to go through the data rather than like just doing an append all and throwing it all there together. Um, so as people who use D3, I'm sure you 
might cringe at like a for loop to go through the data and rather than doing something that's so um, available like enter and append all. But that, um, that's definitely something that I learned as a way to improve going forward. Yeah, this is my question to Brian. I'm just curious, because um, you said you're in management science, right? Yes, right. Like some of the earliest industrial engineering applications related to sports and athletic performance. And you just wanted to take The question is about how a lot of uh, or not a lot, but some, some amount of early industrial engineering was uh, applied to sports. Uh, and just to talk about that kind of, I guess, where I feel like maybe my place is in that. Is that a fair characterization? Okay. Um, well, to be completely honest, I wasn't aware of that. So, <laughs> um, I will say that, um, so my undergrad is from Michigan, uh, industrial and operations engineering. And uh, I will say that one of the very first things that drew me to be an industrial engineer uh, at that point was uh, thinking about uh, you know advanced analytics in sports and how uh, to improve decision making you know both you know long term like in terms of player acquisition strategy and also like in game strategy as well so um, in that sense I guess it's kind of like a happy coincidence but uh, <laughs> yeah it, it, it is something that w struck me very early on. Uh, into my like exploration of that topic, I guess. Yeah, thanks. You got one back there. I'm curious, do you get a critique from the judges on this competition? Do you think you should or look at the... The winning one's pretty cool. I don't know if you guys have looked at it. The winning one's pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, I... So the question was, did we get any critique from the judges and how do we think we compared to other people? So, uh, no, we didn't actually get any critique. We just got a message. We got second, so that was exciting. <laughs> um, there is a website that has all of the top entries together, and I, I can't pull it up right now, probably. What was that? Oh, cool. Okay, so on Twitter, D3 Bay Area has a link to it. But the... Um, <laughs> The top one had a lot more interaction. Uh, it was honestly much better uh, in terms of the D3 especially and also just the visualization I thought was quite good. And there were, oh yeah, here it is. Um, so cool stuff, you can do cumulative, you can do all sorts of statistics. And then beyond that, there were a lot of different takes on how to do things. Somebody used 3.js, which uh, some of you may be familiar with, which I thought was really cool. It didn't really add much to the understanding, but it's cool to see a 3.js implementation. Um, yeah, I mean, you could go and explore them yourself more, but people kind of went all sorts of different ways in terms of doing more of a graph, like overlaying graphs of different people on the same chart versus how we had separate charts and um, organizing things. Yeah, there's the... There's the 3.js one. It's fun to watch. So there are a lot of different interpretations on how best to communicate this same, essentially the same data set. Uh, providing feedback from us on our work. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that I was really happy with uh, with our with our work was how we were able to incorporate so many things beyond just the raw data, specifically the World Series, the awards won, you know, it, times when a player was a league leader in something. Uh, that's something that made our presentation different from the other ones. So, what do you think, Robert? Time for maybe one more question. Yeah. Um. As part of the competition or as part of the discussion within your team, did you guys have an idea of who the audience would be? Like a, somebody, a very technical statistician familiar with baseball stats or more of a you know, reader of New York Times, kind of some familiarity or that guided your design? Thanks. The question was, 
what audience we had in mind for our presentation, whether that would be someone with more uh, technical uh, expertise or maybe like a reader of the New York Times, for example, and Ryan's got an answer prepared. Oh, yeah, so they very upfront let us know that these were our judges. Um, and uh, <laughs> and um, so I remember when we first uh, looked at this panel and like read about who, who they are, we realized that um, most of them were primarily uh, baseball people and then with some interest in data visualization and data science as opposed to mostly data viz people that have some interest in baseball. And so that kind of informed the way that we uh, went about the uh, just ideation process of you know, what should this look like. Yeah, so when we, were, when we were looking at this list of judges, Ryan had this really ambitious idea. <laughs> and this goes back to one of the contentious things we were talking about, maybe. But Ryan's idea was, you know those ESPN 30 for 30 shorts that are like, you know, tell story via video? You know, Ryan had this idea, like, what if, what if we did like a video, like visualization of, of the, the data, you know? Um, and I was, like, I was like, Ryan, this is really, really cool. Like, maybe a little bit more than we're capable of doing right now. Um, but yeah, that, that goes to uh, you know, the audience that we had in mind. We knew that we were looking for more creative presentation than we were uh, necessarily um, efficient summary of the data. We, we definitely made a goal to make it a creative presentation, you know, something, uh, something a little bit different from, uh, from what somebody else might do.